My name is Michael Navarro. My DOC number is 410-318. All right, Mr. Navarro, you're here this morning seeking the commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced March 1999 uh, to a life sentence for first degree murder. Then in February 2000, to 40 years for manslaughter conviction, I'll have Arlene Parrish. Uh, those sentences are running concurrently. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Let me, uh, Mr. Navarro, we have some folks who have joined us today. Let me just recognize those people here in support. We, um, here with us today, we have Jude Henry, uh, Arion Henry, yes. Angela Smith, and then yes. by then, we have Mr. Norris Henderson. Uh, here in opposition, we have Pamela Chris, Cassandra Green, Amy Evans, Dr. Francis, Chandria Green, Michelle Hartford. And at the appropriate time, we'll allow three people in favor, three people in opposition to speak. Um, first, your case this afternoon, this morning, has been assigned to Mr. Pete Freeman. Would you answer his question? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Navar, uh, how old are you? I'm 40, 40 years old. Okay, and how long have you served on this charge? 26 years. Okay. Um, what's your level of education? Uh, 12th grade. I went to the 12th grade, didn't graduate. Yeah. And right now I have my GED. Well, I saw where you got your GED. So you got that while you was in prison? Yes, sir. So boy, it's kind of confusing what went on in that house. Uh, tell me what happened in that house. What went on that 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 night? What was this all about? It had to be a lot more than what the rep report said. Okay. Uh, normally, uh, we would go over and use drugs at Miss Marion Jones' house, and this was something that we did on the regular. Uh, this particular day. It was just like usual. Uh, I had drugs. Uh, Mr. Brian Dublin had drugs. And what we would do is we would just put the drugs on the table and it just be like a jubilance. We're getting high. We talk, we conversate. Sometimes we get in a few uh, arguments, but it's nothing where it could be physical or anything like that. And as the day went on, we continue to use and use and use. Uh, I would say we use drugs about several hours. Okay. And what, what happened after that? And after I made the decision that I reached my threshold, I was ready to go. And with the drugs, I had the most of the drugs that was left over. So when leaving, I wanted to leave with the drugs. But as I got to the door, we was arguing about who owed who and how I was going to pay them. And I made a decision that I wasn't going to give no more drugs up after I hadn't used enough. Okay. And what happened next? After that, we got in a confrontation. But before the confrontation started, Marvin Hoffert came to the house. Once Marvin Hoffert entered the house, upon Marion's word, asked me to open up the door. I let him in. I gave him some drugs. I supplied him with drugs. But the argument continued between me and Brian and Reginald Collin. Ms. Marion Jones didn't have anything to do with that at that time. So before I can leave, before I can leave, the competition, we got into a physical competition and we started fighting. And I produced the gun. I shot my friends that are close to me. And after that, everything else became chaotic in the house. And I'm the only sole per perpetrator of the crime. And what was uh, your co defendant's role in this? Brian Wright. I understand that they had me down as, as uh, having a co-defendant, but he has nothing to do with this charge. Nothing, totally nothing. Everything that transpired was done by me. He didn't he have a gun at the house. Also? He was not at the house. He wasn't at the house? No, sir. And they got several people that said he was in the living room standing over the one of the people. True. That's true, but he was not at the house. I committed all, all that happened that day with the crime. Is my doing. Okay, I'm, I'm a little confused now. 
That's right. If he was standing in the living room over one of the people you shot, he was at the house, right? Yeah, that's what the report said. Yes, sir. But he was not there. And he got 10 years and he wasn't even there? He took 10 years after the fact, but he was not there. Okay. Um, so you shot one of the victims. I think it was Mr. Collins. And uh, then you shot him twice after he fell. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And then how did Miss Miss Jones get shot? As I went through the house, I went to shoot him. I felt like everything that was that was going down was already planned before I before it all happened. I thought they all had a hand in it. Any of them had a gun? No, sir. None of them didn't have a gun. None of them had a gun. So you just lost it and went to shoot. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, sir. Um, you, you did a lot of drugs. You've already admitted to that. Uh, what kind of treatment have you received for your drugs? Uh, rehabilitation, substance abuse, substance abuse, living in balance, one and two, and alcohol anonymous. What have you learned about these drugs? I understand yeah. that the triggers, but the triggers, yeah. a lot of the situations I was putting myself in, this is what triggered me to be the person I am committing these crimes. Uh, what? I didn't hear you, sir, speak. What are your triggers? Music is one of them. Uh, the drugs itself, the choice of drugs, alcohol, it makes me violent, as well as marijuana with the heroin mix. Uh, a lot of uh, just the scenery itself. If you get put, put in these situations, uh, I want to say it. If you do the things that put you, yourself in a situation where you shouldn't be, then you act out. And a lot of these drugs is what causes my situations. I've been accused of using drugs since the age of 10 years old, from juvenile uh, incarceration up until my adult incarceration. It's always been drugs. Consider yourself a drug addict? Yes, sir. Um, you think you'll always be a drug addict? Yes, sir. And what about alcoholic? Yes, sir. Um, what other programs have you taken? And, and which one you got the most out of? Well, I've, I've taken all my reentry programs, 100 hours, victim awareness, uh, uh, anger management, thank you for a change. Uh, I go back to the substance abuse. That's the program that I got the most out of because I got an opportunity to understand who I am as a person. And by doing that, uh, I learned what my triggers were, not putting myself in situations that would trigger these things uh, for me to use these drugs. And once I use these drugs, I become uncontrollable. And I was able to identify that with that program. I didn't know that at first. I just want to be a party boy, have fun, but now I understand if I take myself away from the situation, I wouldn't be in this situation I'm in today. Okay. Um, you have two children. You have any contact with your kids? Yes, sir. How often do you have contact with them? I call them regular on the phone and talk to them. Uh, just recently, I talked to my daughter. She's having a, a gender party. Hopefully, that. Uh, I find out once I get back because I talked to her the night before to know what the gender is going to be of my next grandbaby. Um, you have law enforcement opposition. The chief is opposed. Uh, the victim's uh, nephew is uh, opposed. Uh, Michael Harper's cousin. 
and sister is a of Marion is opposed. Uh, Barbara Duck Douglas is, is opposed. Your mother, uh, your mother Marion Jones is opposed. So you have a lot of opposition, which is to be expected. Yes, sir. Uh, you have some family in your support. Uh, you had 34 writers, but you had none, none since 2013. What changed in 2013 that you stopped getting writers? Uh, I talked to a lot of uh, guys that are older than me, and they were saying that the path that I was going now, and they started mentoring me, telling me that the only way you're going to see something in life is you got to do right. You got to find a way to give back to your community. I started getting myself involved in various programs to give back to my community. Uh, with that said, it started making me look at life different. Give me a purpose to live for. When I first entered uh, Angola, I really didn't want to live anymore. But once I got here and started talking to older guys that seen what I was going through and what I was doing, you know, they pulled my coat and told me, hey, man, if you want to be somebody, you can be somebody right here. It doesn't matter where, just live life and give back. So I got involved in every program I can. And I'm currently involved in Pulse. Uh, you have a low risk, uh, minimum customer, uh, institutional record is good. Um, what is your medical condition? I think you have some medical problems. Oh, uh, I take high blood pressure medicine. And uh, I've been diagnosed with having premature glaucoma. I have no Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. LeBar. How are you? I'm fine. How are you doing, Mr. Roche? Good. Mr. LeBar, I'm interested in your triggers as far as drugs and alcohol. You said music. Is there any type of music? Or the, uh, tell me or explain to me how music triggers your uh, desire for drugs and alcohol. At the, uh, at the time, a lot of rap music I used to listen to. And the music used to get involved into my reality. I go from reality into the fantasy of it. And the drugs were, were kind of make it conducive to do that. And I had a lot of pent up anger in me, you know, from, from family situation, my mother going to jail. I was raised by my grandmother, who I love, and my grandfather, but my family, or as my paternal mother, was not there. And so a lot of this music is what raised me through these situations. I listened to the music, and I started adopting to it and started accepting it as a way of guidance. And a lot of it was very, very negative. And most of it is rap music at the time. Sure. I didn't hear you, sir. Thank you, sir. Warden Falco, is there any input from the facility? Yeah, you, you guys have spoken about his record. Uh, his last write-up was was in 2013 on uh, on a, on a three on a fine. Since then. Um, He's moved up through the ranks as far as custody from a men C, men B, and uh, most recently in 18. So for the last, uh, you know, four years, five years, a men A, uh, he's held uh, positions at the CDC warehouse. Uh, those positions have a lot of responsibility because of the, the, the potential and the temptation of a lot of things there that could uh, be picked up and, and brought out no problems with him on that and the most recent has been the last couple of years with him in the pause program which has been a very good program for the offenders that are participating in it as well as the community dealing with uh with with the dogs going out to vets and and helping them so he's done well for us okay thank you all right um we'd like to hear from the folks who are in support first that we hear from mr henderson Uh, good morning. Uh, I've I really been knowing Mike all of his life. Uh, I've come out that same 
housing development that Michael came out of and so all the things, his reality, what he was saying is real. Uh, I know his mother uh, and know the challenges that, you know, he faced as a kid coming up. And I remember when you first come here, I was surprised he was here uh, in Angola, but I, I was one of the guys he was talking about that kind of like told him, hey, man, look, this is a, you have to get your act together. And uh, I am excited by the fact that he has uh, his service with pause and all the other stuff he's doing, reaching out to other young men who are in his age bracket that came to prison that were wilding out, uh, so to speak, that they've kind of like got themselves together. And so I think the, the, the tragedy of his circumstances is kind of like you say again, he owned it. It was like, this was my reality. This is what I thought was life was all about. And once he began to reconcile with that, that he realized that no life is about something else. And he tried to seek and find what that fulfillment is. And I think he has. And I think uh, it's evident in his conduct record. I think it's evident in the work that he put in inside the institution. And like the warden said again, it's like, you know, this guy's kind of like when you come and ask that in the sense of the things you're doing. And I know sometimes when we say guys are becoming ad set, I know firsthand what that means. Sometimes you become an institution of need and some folks will say, well, if you're doing that well, let leave him there. But I think it is a proof in the pudding that the institution has done what it was designed to do. And that's the correct behavior. And I think in Michael's case, the institution has done just that as correct as behavior. Uh, testament of his low learning school, I don't think we would ever have that kind of uh, situation out of Michael ever again, because he's recognized what all of his triggers are, all the way down to just music. And it's rarely that people would tell you that music had that kind of influence uh, over them. And the fact that he acknowledged uh, the substance abuse, the alcohol and drugs, and uh, the impact that that music had on his environment uh, says a lot about who Michael has become. So I would just hope that, you know, the board will consider making the recommendation. I'm here personally as a family friend, but also our organization is here to support Michael every step of the way in the event that he is successful today or in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, yeah, we have one agent speak a little louder so he can hear you. Mr. Navarre can hear you. Uh, my name is Victoria Henry. Mike Navarre, nephew. He raised me since a kid. My mom was locked up for 50 years. My father was locked up for 25. Came into my life as a young kid. Um, first thing I've had so far is my Right now, you know, my kids look at him as their grandfather, who he grew up and everything. Got me out of trouble. This is me right here. I never sold drugs a day in my life. Um, went to a small private school. We always helped my grandmother for the me and school and everything. Yeah. They you know, I'm here just to say that everybody deserves the same thing. You can't change the past. You can move forward to build better things for the future. And the biggest thing is, you know, deep down in this talk, we've been talking for 26 years. When you first did you know, 1995, I was just into the past. And over the years, he's grown and learned how to adjust. Everything he's done, he's good with it, he's really helped. In between that time, he practically taught me how to be not to make the same mistakes. Anymore. If it's easy for someone of my caliber, growing up so poor and everything, to go the wrong direction, then life would be you know, left the wrong way or you go right to right. You know, just coming up in the environment that we grew up in, it's really different. You know, like I said. I no no mother, no father, but I have no. In between that time, you know, always visiting me in jail, just 
always able to get knowledge that he passed on to me. Now my kids are able to get the same knowledge. I have a daughter right now that will be graduating next year with a bachelor's degree in science. I have another son that right now is in the 10th grade. They're just growing up and they're always constantly talking to them. They're going to visit go to you. know, we send pictures and and I do know that everybody's circumstances is a whole lot different. Growing up, I was always told I was going to be a participant. That was a harsh word for me, but when I really learned about being accepted, that's the thing about in life. You cannot change things, but you have to learn how to accept things and deal with all of it. As you can tell, if you look at the story, everything that he's done in between that time, the average person in 26 years, Probably haven't done half the same people. Every program that he can get involved in, he's involved in. You know, just like talking, like, you know, we made him like my kids, for instance. I'm like, I wanted my daughter to actually pick something that she can actually build off of in college. We talked about I'm like engineering. Like, engineering is a great thing, but it might not be for her. You know, so he's, he's, not, he's getting a bachelor's degree fine, but he's going to be taking PT school for physical therapy or better play his sports. So he's like, one child always has to look after the other child. And that's what, it, that's what it's about right now. Like we're trying to look out for him. You know, we're trying to keep a family together. It's unfortunate that another you know, he have, has to have grief for him. Because it's, it's not an easy job. Now there are other people on the other side that are watching them and the lady right here and everything. You know, I know it's sometimes, it's sometimes everything. And I do agree with it. You know, just coming up as a young adolescent, you know, adult that we do you know the thing. You know, we have smoking, we get the foster family members and everything. You know, how many people are actually playing basketball with and everything? Instead, not the best situation. Done. No. But whatever situation, there's always going to be not just for the family that loves someone, but also for the person that commits crime and just with involvement. A lot of times, it's all for everyone to do that. Inside of the conversation, you never can handle it. That's it. I don't look at him as almost what he has in the closet. And granted, at least I can help him be reestablished established in this world. I have a small nonprofit organization. I'm a part of a union, a trade. That's one of the reasons he's taking his electrician. Right now, want to be able to help them learn the new world that we have in society that's been in the day. Mr. Hicks, I'd like you to have it. Can you wrap it up for us so we can hear from Ms. Smith? Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. Ms. Angela Smith? My name is Angela. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Well, I feel like when Michael was a child, a very small baby, his mother weren't ready to raise him and his brother. My mother and my sister raised both of them. I come up in a home, at the home of a mother and father. And they try to inspire everything that they can. And so Michael and Michael had a large village. I had six sisters and two brothers, and we all put in Michael life for cold, food, condition, anything that was necessary for him growing up. I'm a person that believes in any and everyone can change if you put the work into it. Michael was living with me at the time that he got into trouble. 
I was working, leaving home at four o'clock in the morning, so I didn't see much of my son. When I did see him, he was asleep because me getting up at four in the morning, and sometimes he wouldn't come home. But this particular time, I didn't come home and I didn't hear the news. I had to get it on the street from someone else because I was working on hours. When I found that out, I was so hurt because Micah always was a, a shy person for the child. I knew more about Micah using the drugs today instead of here than I ever knew. I knew he got into the trouble in a house where drugs were being used, but I never knew the amount of drugs that Michael was using until he spoke out his mouth today. Two of the people that was in the house that got shot was Michael's good friend. And the house caught a fire. And Michael them always had a lot of pajamas and socks and drawers because everybody in the family brought these kind of things to the house for Michael and his brother. And when the house caught a fire, Michael took all of the clothes, put them in a bag, and would leave out of my mother's house when I got there. I asked my sister, I said, Where's Michael going with all the clothes? Michael said, My friend's house caught a fire and they don't have no clothes. And I left myself to say, Gee, I had underwear and a t shirt in a drawer for myself because I'm going to give them this so they can have clean clothes to put on. Michael used to get my sister to feed these kids because it was his friend. And for me to hear what I heard today, He's not alone. Because the word is to do better, you have to know better. I think Michael found out that he did not know better when this happened. But I do think right now, because I've been following Michael from the time that he got into the trouble, I was the one that just spoke to him, got the attorney, and did the same for Michael and did the newspaper. I think Michael had learned something. Think he believed that there is a God. And at the time, he didn't have that, he had it in him, but something controlled what he had been taught from a child. And I believe with the help that Michael was going to have, and he come home, I think he would be a good supper. So first of all, he was very smart in school. He loved to read. And he had up. And today, he still has that. Yes, and I thank you for letting me speak to Michael. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. All right. Um, could we hear from Ms. Michelle? Michelle yeah, Park. Good morning. Thank you for your the Thank you. 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 This is not, it's simply, it's simply a crime of passion or accident. But only one of the betrayal. The defendant was raised as one of us. Uh, uh, he is no stranger to our immediate and distant family members. He is from each other. He is from each other. Went to the same elementary, middle, and high school. He spent nights. It seems like a dream, but it's been an absolute nightmare for the past 26 years. The state is when a random act of violence with the aggression and participation of the Indians inspired. In fact, it was a mere low hearted act of violence to respecting victims, to unsuspecting victims, to trust the defendant with their lives, and to a former case. 
The victim leaves and come behind that they've never met him, nieces and nephews, and five children that have vivid memories of him and a flourishing career as a musical artist that would never come to While many may say, I'm sealed all wounds. These wounds are everlasting. For example, since this incident occurred, my brother had suffered with drug abuse and addiction, post traumatic stress, identity crisis, depression, and survivor guilt. There have been many instances of drug overdose used to escape reality. We are plagued with the thought of facing once again a close family friend who looked up to a brother and acquaintance that nearly took his life. Nearly two and a half decades ago, my brother was robbed out of his teenage years, and the transition into adulthood has been a constant struggle over the past 20 years. My brother's doctors discovered that there were remains of a bullet fragment left behind from his initial injuries and surgery that turned cancerous and resulted in multiple surgeries in his system. Facial features are now unrecognizable. He can't eat. It's challenging to breathe, and he had no teeth, which causes the inability to chew and swallow properly. These issues my brother suffered are constant reminders of what happened on that faithless night. A relief in reckless endangerment to the immediate family members of the victims as a defendant is not a stranger to our community and family, as we all share the same plan. There has never been an apology given by the defendant. No sign of regret or gestures of being sorry or remorseful. The simple feelings of regret or misfortune that he exposed by God's grace. His identity was exposed. Let not the board forget there were four victims of this crime, and without the two survivors, the defendant wouldn't would have been amongst my greedy family, pretending as if he did not know the perpetrator. The only regret the defendant has. Seemingly shown was that he was exposed. My family is still in mourning today, just as we were on that unfaithful night in 1996. For family members, saw victims, someone that was so close to our family is continuously and constantly stressful, disheartening, and unacceptable. An untimely release of the defendant puts us all in danger of retaliation and revenge. It pains us to see old photos of the victims and offenders and defendants together. Those photos were taken not knowing that one day the defendant would be the judge, jury, and executioner of the victims who trusted him with an untimely loss of their life. I do think that my family should be put in a position to live in constant. I don't think my family should be put in a position to live in constant fear of our lives at such time as a last. We deserve the right to live peaceably. As law abiding citizens. Growing up in a close knit community is unfathomable to imagine sharing the same grocery aisle, seats near each other at sporting events, or close tables in local restaurants is frightening. However, that is what we will face in addition to the trauma that we continuously have been dealing with for the last 26 years if this is separate. Thank you. We appreciate you. We appreciate your remarks. We have uh, by phone Ms. Cassandra Green. Go ahead, Ms. Yes. Green. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes. Um, my, I'm, I'm the sister of Marion Jones. Michael devastated our lives 26 years ago. My sister trusted him. She invited him in her house as a friend. I don't know nothing about the drugs that what he said about it was all behind drugs. My sister invited him, him into her house as a friend. He sat at her table at eight, then every day at her house. I will go to visit my sister. He'll be sitting at the table playing spades and dominoes with my sister as a good friend. The morning I got the phone call that my sister was in that house dead, I wouldn't have never in a million years would have thought it was him because he was always there. He befriended her daughter. He dated her, her daughter for a minute. And then to turn back right around and then take her life. My little niece, my, my sister was babysitting her grandchild the morning that he killed her. We thought the baby was shot because she was all covered in blood. 
she was one years old at the time she was in the house she was laying on top of my sister i guess she was trying to see if her grandma was asleep or not because she didn't know anything about debt or anything because she was just too young but he was doing so much shooting in the house that bullets were flying everywhere my mother is deceased right now today she grieved herself to death over her firstborn child being murdered shot down like a dog in her own house where you're supposed to feel safe at in your own home and someone coming in and take your life my sister had nothing to do with what was going on with him and anybody else he claimed that he was going they was fussing over drugs she had and it, nothing to do with that he could have handled whatever he had to handle outside of her house and i don't think he deserved to be let loose to live his life and my sister would never live her life because she's gone forever. Forever. And we have to deal with that every day. Every day. We think, I wake up thinking about my sister. I go to bed thinking about my sister. She helped my mother raise me. And that's that's pretty much the sums it up. I don't think he deserves to be let loose. I, do, I think he deserved to be where he's at for the lives he took and for the lives that he tried to take. It wasn't only my sister he killed. He killed another guy, which was his friend. He killed, he shot my cousin, Brian Dooley, which is deceased right now because of the bullet that he left in Brian's head. He shot four people, only two died, but he shot four people that morning. And Ms. Green, we appreciate your uh, participation this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we hear from Pamela Chris? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. I'm Pamela Chris. I'm Aries Jones' sister. Ever since she died on October 7, 1996, we've been going through this pain in my heart. He took away our puzzle. She was a piece of the puzzle. My mom had eight children. That was the oldest of all of us. We have no big sister no more. She didn't see her grandchildren grow up. Her children is still grieving. She didn't have a chance to see nothing. He took everything from us. My mama grieved to death. We have no more mother because of her child, his decisions, his actions. And now he want clemency, he want parole. I don't think so. I'm still grieving. You can't bring her back. He took multiple lives. He just didn't, he broke up lots of families. Why would we give him anything? He didn't give us nothing but grief, pain, heartache. No, I don't approve of him getting no pardons, clemency, whatever it is. He deserved what he got, a life for a life. When we went to court, they said life with no parole. And that's what we want, life with no parole. We can't bring her back. And we don't want him out here to hurt other people's family members. Just like we are hurt, we'll hurt other family members. I don't think he's ready to come out here to face the fact, no. And that's what I have to say. And I thank you very much. For your time and your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate your presentation as well. Uh, Mr. Navarro, is there a statement you'd like to make to the board before we go? No. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do sympathize with the family because I do understand. And everything that they said about me, I did take their family members, their loved ones, and I can't bring them back. But I do want them to know I do feel their pain and I go through it every day. And I just want to bring closure so they can know and hear from me that what I did, I was wrong about it. There's nothing good. It was there's no winners and no losers. What I did was wrong. What I do ask them is to, you know, have me in their prayers as if I have them in their prayers, have them in my prayers. I'm very sorry for what I did. Uh, 
Okay, uh, Mr. Bullard. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, very difficult case. Biggest thing is that four families were affected. And, you know, two people ended up dead. Uh, one died later. One is, is disabled. Um, and you're doing good in prison. You're doing very good. I mean, you're doing all the right stuff you need to get out. But 26 years for uh, two people dying and all of the other pain, I just don't think today's the day. I think it'll be coming soon, which I, I know is going to be hard on the victims when it does come. And I, I thank them for showing up here today and speaking. But at this point in time, I vote for them. This is Jackie. I'm Mr. Life Live, I would like to uh, commend you on the things that you've done so far. Uh, but I agree with Mr. Green. Um, not only two people killed, but four people shot, how many lives destroyed. And I, I just don't feel that the crimes are sufficient. Going to address the seriousness of the outcome. I'm going to be working hard and keep doing things. And I agree with Ms. Green that your day will come for a few minutes not today. Mr. Roche. Thank you, Mayor and Chairman. Mr. LeVar, you already know that the very here today. Would you need four votes when you only have to be left? But I want to tell you that I have been sitting on this board for seven years. Your interview today was an honest and outstanding display of honesty on your part. You did not skirt the issue. You did not skirt responsibility. You took full responsibility for your actions. And very rarely do I see an individual who just tell it like it is. And you did this morning. And I do appreciate that. I applaud your work with the FARS uh, program. We're helping disabled uh, veterans and other individuals who are in need of a, a, a animal to help them to go about their ordinary functions in life. And that you should be commended for that. How did this been marked by one thousand? Uh, excellent program. Around 2013, you may have turned around to listen to a seasoned offender who knew how to manage life and was incarcerated. Your disciplinary uh, conduct improved drastically. My vote is basically the primarily because of the honesty that you displayed this morning. My vote is to recommend your governor to commute your sentence to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. Mr. Maribel. <clears throat> Mr. Navarre, uh, You're a low risk. You've got some excellent programs. Uh, your disciplinary record has been fairly good, especially since 2013. I agree with all of the things that you have said. Uh, you do have two votes uh, to deny. Uh, my vote would be to grant. That's not enough to get you by today, but uh, I hope it's enough to, to, to make you realize that you're working, you're in the right direction, and perhaps. Uh, a little more hard work. Next time, it might be a little different. I vote today would be for Grant uh, with the meeting uh, commutation in 99 years with the meeting for around the day. Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, 
mission of art, so you know what the outcome is today. We you know it requires four votes. Uh, I would also that you can read your sentence, but because you've received two votes that were unfavorable to your application, your application for clemency can be denied today. We'd like to say for us. Thank you. Okay, so there is a lot to unpack there. We're 45 minutes in. I'll start by apologizing. I know when people get up to the podium, you uh, really can't hear what they're saying, which is, um, which, you know, obviously it sucks, but I um, maybe I'll put like a marker in where you can forward it, <clears throat> but. You know, it is, it is the victim speaking, so just to not include it wouldn't be right either. Mr. Roche stole my thunder uh, by him saying that in all the years he's done this, he hasn't really seen someone have such an honest interview. And I, he stole my thunder because that's what I was thinking. It, it was, uh, he, 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 Wow, there's so much to unpack here. Um, so let's like, where do we begin? He really just straight up went and said what he did. He didn't make excuses. He didn't have, you know, and so often and, and almost, it almost feels like it's it's all, all the time where people just aren't completely honest. But he was completely honest about what he had done. And then what was where the wrench got thrown in there is, how his friend spent 10 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And for those of you who are like, might be thinking, how is that possible? He must have done something, must be something going on. He's, you know, putting uh, money in his commissary to keep him quiet. And I don't, I, I don't buy any of that. I, I think it's very easy to believe that someone can get locked up for something they didn't do. None of the victims brought it up as a, as a, as as you know countering him saying he was lying. So just to think about that in this one case, four people were shot, two died, one died later from his wounds, another died, another is handicapped. All the families that were affected, and to his friend that then got wrongly accused and all the lives that were changed from this crime. You know, he, he, he listening to his story, the, how long he'd been on drugs for starting at such a young age, I think he said 10 years old. The anger he had towards his mother. Um, and then what was really interesting to me, because I have, I really haven't heard this, was him talking about um, how the how how the how angry mostly rap music um, just brought the worst out of him, which I, I think is really insightful. I mean, when I'm angry, I put on my my angry music, and you know it can be helpful, but in some ways, right, to help. Um, and happy music can make you happy and you, you know we all have our different musics for our moods but there is a lot of angry music out there that if all if uh and also a lot of the lyrics are are um pretty bad and if that's all you're gonna look up to i think over time it can influence someone that's just my opinion i don't know what you all think about that of course it's no excuse that's not where i'm going with this just interesting that he had that insight He really was, he really is an honest, just, he really left such a great impression. Uh, really, up until the victims started talking, I was like, I I wanted him released. But once you hear the victims, and you just get reminded of all of the pain that he caused, yeah, he was a different person. But he was, you know, completely messed out of his mind on 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 drugs. 
he pulled out his gun and he just started shooting up the place. And these were his friends. And he served 26 years. And uh, also, ultimately, of course, I agree with the situation. Now, I do, I do believe you will get out eventually, and that will be very painful for all the victims. Um, and I don't really know how to dive into that. You know, they, they say prison serves two purposes, right? One is to punish, and one is to rehabilitate. And it certainly seems like he's been rehabilitated. Um, and if he were to get out, he could probably help a lot of kids, a lot of people. Uh, and so the next question is, how much more punishment should he have? Um, where I think he went wrong, though, the one part was his his uh, his final speech. That I don't know if he prepared it, if it was off the tip of his tongue, or but I didn't. I thought that he, I thought that he failed that one to say certain things like um, he wanted to ask the victims to include him in their prayers, and you don't have a right to ask the victims to include you in their prayers. Like, why would that even be something like, you know, are you kidding me? You don't have a, you don't have a right. You shouldn't be in their minds and their thoughts. Forget their prayers. Right. I mean, uh, he, he, I think he probably meant something differently by it, but it, it was a bad final speech. He had a few blunders in there. There are no winners and no losers. Yeah, there were losers. Everyone you shot, everyone in your life, everyone in their lives were losers. So saying no winners or losers was pretty crummy too. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And I'll say that's a wrap.